Today I'm hosting Branko Brkic, the founding editor of the Daily Maverick, South Africa's leading daily online newspaper. And today we will talk about many things, about high-level corruption in South Africa and the Balkans, challenges of working independently in captured states, possible ways to decapture the state, about fighting disinformation in the media sector, about the influence of China, Russia, and other third powers in South Africa, trying to draw some, if not direct, parallels with the Western Balkans, and we will also tackle many other topics. Branko Brkic is founder and editor-in-chief of Daily Maverick, the South African online news site. Branko started his career by publishing science fiction books in 1984 in what was then Yugoslavia. In the following seven years, he went from being a project-based book publisher to launching the then Yugoslavia's biggest privately owned publishing house. In 1991, he left Yugoslavia and moved to South Africa, where he continued working in publishing, this time in magazines. He launched business, politics, technology, culture and wildlife magazines, including the Maverick magazine, which preceded the online newspaper Daily Maverick. Since its launching in 2009, Daily Maverick has now reached monthly readership of 10 million people. Branko and his publications received many awards, such as Taco Caper Investigative Award in 2018 and Global Shining Light Award in 2019. Welcome to the Lighthouse Podcast, Branko. Thank you. Perhaps the best way to describe you and your, your work is by the name of your new site, Maverick. Um, Maverick, for non-native speakers, means independent-minded individual, a free spirit. So, uh, can you tell us something about the beginnings in Serbia and Yugoslavia and how this experience shaped your later work? Because at the beginning, you publish science, science fiction books. And, uh, for example, my older brother and I were virtually fighting over Isaac Asimov's or Stanislav Lem's Solaris or other books. And I, I remember the dusty Polaris publishing house editions and others, probably yours as well, lying all over, all over the floor of our flat. Can, can you tell us about this? And these were heavy times. So, just to start start with that, in uh, uh, a couple of my, of my friends and I, we, we la launched uh, a what we called Yugoslavian Science Fiction Society, Lazar Komacic, in uh, 1981, which was very successful. And in 1982, uh, the publishing law was um, uh, amended in Serbia, not in entire Yugoslavia, but in Serbia, where you could actually uh, publish the book that. Um, you yourself translated as well. So translation was um, considered an act of um, creation, not only the writing. So uh, the first man who, uh, first person who actually um, recognized the opportunity there was Zoran Živković, and uh, he bought the rights for um, Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey 2010, which was the sequel to the 2001. And um, he made he made a massive success of it. He advertised it in uh, Galaxia and other newspapers. He made what was absolutely crucial. He made a database of people who were interested in science fiction in all Yugoslavia. And then in 1984, um, I had an idea to publish uh, the Blade Runner and uh, the book. Um, um, the problem was I couldn't speak any English. <laughs> um, so so uh, um, man, man, managed to managed to get some subscriptions for, for, for Blade Runner and uh, I managed to hire a translator and I was essentially for the next many years uh, my books were I was publishing books as a co translator although I couldn't speak any English <laughs> in, in those days. So um, uh, to, to cut a long story short, um, um, I managed to um, then uh, uh, spread into into political slash comedy publishing. I published. I, I don't know if you remember Index uh, Radio Theater. Of course, yes. Uh, Index or Radio Pozdravite. Well, I published the first two books uh, in 1985, 1986. But then going forward, uh, um, you also, as we were approaching the 
1990s and everything that happened, the wars in our country. Um, you published the book on uh, Milosevic's regime in Yugoslavia, and if yeah. I'm not uh, yeah. wrong, that was in 1991. Well, what was that book about? Uh, in in in, a, in the late 1990s, um, uh, we we were about to publish the book "Tito: Technology of Power," which was uh, uh, by Kosta Chavoski, then one of the leaders of opposition, who in in which he was um, rolling out all the all the details about um, Tito's um, um, populism and um, popular populism that he that he managed to um, base his um, 35 years of of uh, power on. And I had an idea as we were finishing the book uh, that he should do the same thing about Milosevic and uh, Costa um, claimed that Milosevic is going to not he's going to win not going to win an election at the end of 1990. And so we made a bet, bet if uh, Milosevic wins that Costa will write about the technology of power of Milosevic. And that's how the, the book the book started. We published it in in uh, late October 1991. You won the bet. Milosevic came to came to power, and something that we Yugoslavs until not then would consider unimaginable, like a scenario from one of your science fiction books, uh, happened. The war broke out, and uh, you decided to move to South Africa. I know from personal experience that to leave is not easy. Whatever happens is at your home, so. Can you tell me how did you come to this decision? Did you consider any alternatives? My my decision was was um, was uh, kind of made much easier by the fact that I received the the call up and um, um, to join the army in a civil war um, in nineteen ninety in late nineteen ninety one. So um, I there was something that happened um, a few months before that, and I. Something happened in the, in the country of Yugoslavia, Serbia, Belgrade. I couldn't recognize my place anymore. It wasn't um, the new new generation came. Uh, the new bunch of people took power, and we were not sharing the same humanity anymore. That was that was uh, that was um, so that actually hastened my decision. So, um, and I chose South Africa because South Africa was opening up at that moment. And my friend, um, Srbolyub Kojadinovic, the famous, the famous um, um, uh, um, uh, cruiser, the guy, the guy who circumnavigated the world, um, and who's one of his books I published, he was my very good friend, uh, told me that South Africa could be a good place to go to because it's opening up and uh, things may, may change, that things may actually go, go uh, get you know, a much better day. So I, I, I left via Stuttgart, um, via the Union Island, and up um, Friday 13th of December 1991. Friday the 13th was my happy day. Ended up in, in South Africa. I had a seven kilos of luggage. Um, I had a um, thousand German marks in my pocket, and I had a one month tourist visa, and I couldn't speak any English. And I was and I was a book publisher. Which obviously, um, if you're a book publisher, you kind of need to need to know the language. So, I was I was slightly handicapped, <laughs> to, to say the least. And I didn't know anybody in South Africa. So that was a, it was it was a, it was a, as cold Turkey as you can think of. Uh, you know, basically just finding yourself in other places, saying this is the test of life. Talking about South Africa, once she told me uh, that. Uh you went to a possibly even more complex place than Yugoslavia at the time. What what were your your first impressions of South Africa when you arrived there? Well, you know, when you arrived to South Africa in those days, you arrived to Johannesburg mostly. Um, South Africa was not a happy place, unfortunately, in those days. And Johannesburg was probably the least happy place of them all. And... Usually, if you arrive, you have a hotel in a place called Hillbro, which is the craziest place of them all in, in South Africa. So, so um, if Hillbro doesn't scare you away, nothing will scare you away afterwards. Um, w- one of the first phrases I heard and I learned in, in the English language was um, that, um, you know, you left a frying pan and jumped into open fire. 
and that and that was that was what South Africa was in those days. It was an extremely extremely um, fearful place uh, place, and for very every reason. Um, just to give you an, an example, in the years um, uh, leading to uh, up to 1994 elections when Mandela became president, um, we had on average between 20 to 25,000 murders a year. Um, essentially, what we what we had was a was a was a civil. It was a, essentially silent war against people of South Africa. It was led mostly by the apartheid regime uh, through the through the uh, squadrons of death. They used to call them third force. Um, it was an extremely worrying place. So funny enough is that I, I you know, um, I, I didn't find I didn't find myself out of place. <laughs> South Africa had many problems that uh, I could share. I could understand from from um, from old Yugoslavia. Multi, it was multiracial, multicultural, multireligious. Um, Incredible, um, you know, um, difference in in a in a in a wealth and status, and it was uh, and it was really really worrying times. Remember uh, in those days because Soviet Union fell apart a few weeks after I arrived to 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 to, to, um, to South Africa. Uh, globally, the world was in a in a in a crazy place. And now fa fast forward to another turbulent moment in recent world history. Uh, 2009, um, the world in financial economic crisis, but another positive thing happens for you at that moment, the Daily Maverick was launched, and it was also the time when social media and online content had already taken off, really, mm. and, uh, you know, comparing uh, to that time with today, Today is much harder to differentiate facts and accurate information from fake news, and uh, and uh, then you, we were entering in phase, so to speak. So, um, how do we fight disinformation in times like these? I mean, this is probably what you were doing essentially with the Daily Maverick. Yeah, well, just to give you an idea, uh, Daily Maverick was not uh, necessarily born out of it wasn't a happy moment. Um, you know, life is a Shakespearean thing. And, you know, just to cue in, I did um, my, my publishing house in Serbia, Yugoslavia published a complete Shakespeare. Um, only the fifth language in the world to publish complete Shakespeare. And um, that uh, my life was very, always very Shakespearean, so, you know, and uh, the Daily Maverick actually grew out of ashes of a magazine called Maverick. That, that I launched in 2005. And uh, Maverick Magazine was um, every inch as rebellious as the word Maverick means, literally. Uh, I set out to, to um, show the stale publishing space in, uh, in South Africa how things should be done. Um, and as in, you know, those terms where operations are successful, uh, a patient is dead. That happened to me. I did prove to them that they are old, that they need to move into 21st century and they're crap. At the same time, they managed to kill me. So, so um, Maverick Magazine went down in 2008 uh, crisis. So in 2009 crisis, um, um, 2009, I managed to cobble some money and, and, uh, and to uh, essentially crawl, crawl our way back um, into, into with five people and 30,000 readers, I managed to crawl back into, into the, this time in online publishing, because in South African space, um, the same players own printing distribution and my comp competitive titles. So it was impossible to go back into print. Um, so to, 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 to fast forward uh, 13 years later, um, we have 120 employees, we've got 10 million readers, and we are the uh, Second biggest by number, but but by far the most most important and uh, uh, most influential um, publication in in a country. And um, if you look at what what our um, um, tagline is, it's defend truth. Um, this is incredibly important, as just well, as you asked about um, uh, fighting disinformation. We're not only fighting disinformation; we're actually fighting the. Um, um, ability to define what's real and what's not real. So it's, it's even, even more, um, even more, um, 
are troublesome, even more dangerous. Because uh, in many countries in the world, and I think America is the first example, they can't agree about what what's real. They can't agree on reality. You know, we in South Africa we still have a chance, and uh, what what we do um, in Delhi Maverick uh, is literally every day uh, to to uh, to to buttress to reinforce the truth and to reinforce the reality and to reinforce the sanity in the center. Um, and it's uh, crucial because it, why is it so important? Because it gives you the reason to exist, it gives you a reason to wake up in the morning. Because you're not fighting only to to um, you know further your publishing goals or to to make it a successful business. No, you're actually fighting to keep South Africa sane and to keep it on a on a on a on a on a, on a, on a kind of narrow path to reality and hopefully narrow path to the escape out of the current crisis. Because um, if you can't agree about what's real, what's not, you can't. If you can't agree on the base on the base thing, what's good, what's what and what's wrong, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, we actually can't have a country. And that's, that's what, what, uh, what Daily Mavic's role today is in South Africa, is to, to actually um, act as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a um, coalescing agent for everything that's good in South Africa, that everything that's decent and, and truthful in South Africa. Yes. Maybe um, to ask you, um, because you said from 30,000 reader, readers to 10 million and uh, what actually uh, gave you this success is speaking truth to power and about power. So coming back to year 2009, uh, that was also the year when uh, you were created, but also when uh, Jacob Zuma, the famously corrupt president of South Africa, came to power. And uh, can, can you tell us something about that uh, government, that regime, and what was it like being an independent voice in such an environment? Well, you see, Jacob Zuma became the head of the ANC in 2007, December 2007. Um, but he was, a, even in those days, he was a highly corrupt, uh, you know, known as a highly corrupt character. And um, he was actually uh, about to be charged with serious crimes. And the month before the election in 2009, they managed to essentially scare the, the National Prosecuting Authority away. Uh, so they dropped the charges. So he became president in April um, 2009. And essentially, uh, it's, it's funny how our trajectories, um, you know, um, um, were intersecting um, in, the, in the coming years. Um, Jacob Zuma um, was not only a uh, fabulously corrupt, he was obviously fabulously inept. So, you know, corruption is, is a big problem which you have in a country, but corruption comes with a twin brother, which is called incompetence. And he, he really brought the full power of corruption and incompetence together. And um, then there was another element here is that for the first time in the history of any modern country that I knew, that I've seen, um, state capture happened. Uh, under under uh, the Zuma, because three brothers from India, the Gupta brothers, who came in to South Africa three years after I arrived to South Africa, but they came in with a with a with a clear um, um, intention to bribe their way to the top. Yeah, with more than one thousand German marks, they wanted to say slightly, yes. Uh, slightly more, slightly more, slightly more than that. Anyway, so what they've done, they managed to place uh, some some bets, small bets, on some on a um, few struggling politicians in, uh, and one of them was Jacob Zuma. So Jacob Zuma becomes president and uh, brothers Gupta get a uh, complete control of South African state or near complete control of South African state. So, so what happened over the years, we, um, Jacob Zuma's incompetence is now eroding the state itself. The Gupta brothers control of the state is starting eroding the economy itself. And then in 2012, the um, the Marikana massacre happened, and Marikana massacre was uh, one of those milestones in in South African history because you had a police controlled by the ANC mopping down their own their own people, miners who were looking who who were post, uh, protesting for for higher wages, and that was a famous Marikana massacre. And David Maverick um, 
we were the ones who actually broke the news about it, that what the real nature of the massacre. And that put us into, into, into really high um, orbit in that moment. And uh, that was our first kind of breakthrough. In 2017, uh, the, the, the situation in South Africa became really almost unbearable with, with, with Zuma's and Gupta's control, um, stifling everything. And, uh, and state security um, under Zuma, which was um, ably helped by the, by, the, by, the, by the Russian state security. Uh, so, so essentially, the, the state security, uh, uh, South African state security, saw, saw their job as a protection of Jacob Zuma as the president, not protection of South African people. And we disagreed with that, and uh, uh, civil society disagreed with that. And the situation became very tense. In early April 2017, I uh, received um, from one of my contacts, I received a hard drive full of emails uh, of the top lieutenant, lieutenant to the Gupta brothers. So that hard drive, um, the, co the content of it became uh, something which is known as the Gupta leaks. And, uh, and um, the Gupta leaks essentially brought Zoom out, took, took Zoom out of, out of power. Um, so that, that hard drive that I received in, in a Johannesburg um, coffee shop that early April day um, contained 150,000 emails from the, the Gupta brothers' um, uh, top lieutenant. And they laid out um, a decade of state capture and abuse. Uh, one important thing happened um, uh, when I got that. I realized that this is bigger than I than myself, and it's bigger than my team, because this was um, we had capabilities, but in order to to do this properly, in order to serve South African people, we needed to to get the partners. So I made two phone calls. Um, one phone call was to my business partner to tell him that we have a game changer, and the, and the second second call was to. Uh, my friend and editor of um, another investigative outfit called Ambugane uh, summoned him to, to meet me in Cape Town as soon as possible. So as a result of it, um, we also included a couple of other uh, um, media organizations. And as a result of it, eventually we published more than 80 exposés. Um, Zuma was, uh, uh, Zuma's faction was kicked out in 2017 ANC Congress. And in 2018, uh, in February, Zuma was uh, kicked out as president of South Africa. So, so it's, that is a short history of, of Zuma and, and me personally, but it never ended, unfortunately, because Zuma, Zuma decided he's not going to uh, disappear um, into, the, into the sunset. And he is, to this day, he is one of the greatest dangers to South Africa's safety and security. You mentioned the, the security service in South Africa and uh, the Russian state's uh, involvement and uh, especially the issue of Russian influence gained uh, even additional relevance uh, both in South Africa and the Western Balkans all over the world really since the Russian aggression in Ukraine started a year ago. Um, you write a lot about this. Uh, so, what are what is Russia doing in South Africa now? We even see that their foreign minister was uh, uh, coming to the country recently. Yeah. Uh, well, you have to understand that the history of the ANC is the history of the ANC that was held by uh, by the countries, socialist countries, and countries of Warsaw Pact. Okay, so Soviet Union helped him a lot. Old Yugoslavia helped a lot. So just to give you another um, little um, snippet which you perhaps don't know, uh, the first Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mandela's government, Afrin Zo, spoke um, fluent Serbian or Serbo-Croatian uh, in, in those days. Um, you, we, were, we were big partners there. Uh, I, my first visit to the post office in, a, in a Johannesburg in 1991, um, there were big posters on on the wall about terrorist um, weapons, and terrorist weapons were either Yugoslavian or Czechoslovakian <laughs> of production. Just to give you give you an idea, so um, th th there's a, there's a long history of connection with the NC and the Soviet Union. Although they managed to um, somehow make a distinction between Russia and Ukraine from within the Soviet Union, um, and it's a, it's a, it's ideological originally, um, but. 
you have to understand is that we, ANC itself is not a coherent force. ANC is not held by the ideology. It, ANC is not held by anything else other than the power itself. Okay, so they have a different strains. One, one very dangerous strain is the kind of nativist strain of the ANC, which is the Zuma and his guys. And that nativist strain has been, has been connected to Russia for a long, long, long time. And um, they've been sending uh, people you know, to be trained in Russia for a long time. So David Mahlobo, who was a, a minister of, of state security during Zuma, um, he was trained in Russia. And he even, uh, just to give an idea, um, his, his, his profile on his cell phone had the might of Russia, belt of Russia, sorry, uh, um, behind it as a sign, belt of Russia, you know. And he was a uh, state security minister of, of South Africa. So Russia was very influential. Um, the Russian oligarchs were, were involved, um, especially in mining, because remember, South Africa in, in some ways had a similar um, economy to Russia as it's resource-based, you know. So, so the, 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 the South African uh, and Russian business people understand each other. So you'll find a lot of Russian, Russian um, and uh, um, uh, um, South African um, mining companies, a uh, lot of uh, um, South African mining businessmen, which are best in the world, by the way, end up serving as chairman or CEOs of, of, um, of a Russian company. So there's a, there's a, there's a rich connection uh, between them. And yet the actual trade between Russia and so it's, it's South Africa is literally next to nothing, literally next to nothing. So, so um, the biggest partner that South Africa has is EU. The second biggest partner is China and then um, uh, the United States. Russia, that is essentially a rounding error. In a, no, so, so there is no economic interest other than maybe being prodded by China. There is no economic interest in, in, a, in, a, in a South Africa um, es- essentially and now effectively taking a position with Russia, especially with the last, last visit to, 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 to South Africa by Lavrov. Yeah. And uh, what about China? You told us that uh, Russian, in Russian trade with South Africa is next to nothing, but it's different with China. Uh, what is China's strategy and approach in South Africa? Well, remember, China has this, this, this um, aggressive um, expansion plan, which had, they had to tamp down now because of the pandemic and their own internal problems. Um, for, for more than last two decades, you know, um, China essentially uh, um, entered every municipality in every country in Africa. And um, you would be shocked if you travel African, the smallest countries in Africa, the smallest villages in Africa, they have a, a Chinese presence. Um, so China is playing obviously much, much longer game in this specific one. It's a much bigger pl- player and it's a much bigger partner to all the governments. and. Uh, um, uh, they, 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 they built quite a bit of infrastructure in, 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 in uh, most of the countries in, in Africa. They, they didn't, of course, they, they used their own, um, um, you know, prison labor, slave labor um, to make it very cheap. And uh, then, uh, you know, they, you know they, they have a tendency not to worry about human rights record of the states they work with and governments they work with. So. Um, they're basically a partners from dreams for all the autocrats that are running African countries right now. In South Africa, um, they are incredibly aggressive. So they, they um, essentially own um, one of the, so they used to be, uh, not, it's not so big anymore, independent newspapers used to be uh, South Africa's biggest um, English speaking uh, uh, newspaper group. Um, they bought into it uh, a while ago. And just to give you an idea, the, the, their website is publishing uh, full-on propaganda, Chinese propaganda, especially from Xinjiang province. You know the um, and the, you know where there's a um, you know the the serious um, human rights violations against Uyghurs happening. They're publishing that propaganda uh, unfiltered. They're just publishing as it is. So so they they're quite aggressive. Um, they um, they have created. Uh, I, I don't know if you're aware of it. We we managed to. Um, we managed to find this um, the network of Indian and uh, kind of lefty and uh, 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 kind of it's kind of difficult to use ideological uh, terms here. We managed to find this network of, of um, intellectuals um, 
that were for for hire all over the world, you know, and uh, they created this this network which is um, planting propaganda and is trying to to uh, to um, you know be quite aggressive uh, in the media uh, spaces all over the world. We discovered them in South Africa, apart from independent newspapers, and uh, what was fascinating, we 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 actually uh, became even more aware of them after we watched the reaction to our um, 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 exposés, which is quite funny. Sometimes you actually need, them, need to, to pull them into, into, into the light. And um, it was quite interesting. So anyway, so they're, in, they're in aggressive in a different way. They are not, um, as far as we understand, they're not conducting what Wagner is conducting. They're not, uh, not being aggressive. They're not being physically aggressive. They're not, being, uh, they're not killing people the way Wagner is doing, they're not uh, conducting targeted assassinations, uh, but aggressive they are, nevertheless. Uh, both Balkans and South Africa are countries with important foreign and domestic organized crime networks operating on their territories. And uh, in uh, our Serbian or Montenegrin media, for that matter, we read a lot about people from the Balkans active in the South African underworld. And um, here in the, in the region, investigative journalists write a lot about links between organized crime and politics. Uh, do you have similar dynamics in South Africa and what is the role of these Serbo-Montenegrin criminals in the South African underworld? I don't know them personally myself and, I, and I'm uh, personally much more in a in political space. Um, but uh, one, one of my top journalists, uh, Karen Dolly, um, we published two of her books and um, she, she traced the connection between um, Balkans, uh, Balkan cr uh, criminal gangs and South African criminal gangs. Because remember, um, South Africa is a major transition, uh, transit point for the drug trades all over the world. You know? um, so so there's, a, there's quite a bit of a link and then uh, again, like, um, Daily Mail, we published a lot of stories of those. Um, and again, we published two books. I personally do, do not have any connection and not actually spending time on that because I, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on the ANC side. Um, the, but what is happening right now is that, is that there's a link um, uh, between, strong link between uh, the political parties in South Africa and the different criminal organizations because they're basically essentially fusing. So, uh, the criminal organizations in South Africa are becoming enforcers for certain um, political groups, okay? And on the other hand, you can see that criminal groups are also influencing policies of those, of those, of those groups. So um, it's actually quite, quite scary to see uh, at which level the South African police service is deteriorating and how some of those things are actually um, happening in public. Um, uh, one of the parties, um, um, which is now um, on the ascendance, which is called Patriotic Alliance in South Africa, is led by a guy called Gaton McKenzie. He was actually uh, a gangster from Cape Flats in Cape Town. Um, he um, he's basically building his power on the, on, the, uh, on the policies of xenophobia. Literally, we're going to kick out all the foreigners from South, from South Africa. And when he talks foreigners, he doesn't, doesn't talk me, myself. He talks Zimbabweans, Mozambicans, Malawians, Nigerians. So all the people who actually can't protect themselves. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's incredible cowardice in this approach. And, and this guy is, is, is actually now um, controlling one of the districts in, in South Africa. And he is now um, a, a, literally a casting vote for the, deciding who's going to be the next mayor of Johannesburg, which is the you know biggest and most important uh, city in South Africa, so that that rise of organized mafia, um, which is not even hiding its 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 its, 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 its actions, is actually really worrying, and uh, that's something that is, um, and I think it's becoming a global global uh, situation. So I don't know, I don't know how how that plays out in Serbia because I don't follow those politics. Um, but here, it's actually pretty, pretty scary, pretty worrying. There are many similarities from what I hear from you uh, and uh, all, all around on what we spoke about. Uh, even though the countries are so distant from each other, 
and so diverse. But in any case, uh, it was um, great talking to you, Branko, and uh, I hope to see you soon uh, here in Belgrade or maybe in South Africa. Thank you.